original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you are doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add a touch of tradition to your life. Reblicon cheese is coming. There are other new cheeses that I will be making over the next few months, but this one is the one I'm most excited about. It gives me a chance to enhance my cheese making and affinage skills, and I love learning and practicing new things. It enlivens my soul to create new things. How about you? Do you like learning? If you ever find yourself saying, I'm so bored, It's time to expend some energy learning something new or doing something you've never done before. Well, let me take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners. I'm glad you found me, and I hope you will stick around. And a hearty welcome back to my veteran homestead-loving regulars. Thank you so much for stopping by the Farmcast. I appreciate you all so much. As usual, there are exciting events and activities going on around the homestead. The cicadas continue to sing. It gets louder and louder every day. It is unbelievable unless you're here. uh, And some of you may be in the area and you hear them. They are so loud. And this will go on for about a month. And um, So there are a lot of empty exoskeletons under the trees and, and some dead cicadas. I've seen some of those too. Again, only about a month. Their their adult life cycle is only about a month. And there's lots of those perfectly round half-inch holes under every tree. I never hear them in the trees, like out the back door, where all of our trees are, where all the little holes are in the exoskeletons. I know they're there. They, but they always seem to be a couple hundred yards away. So maybe they know I'm there and they don't sing. But I don't know. They must be there. And I did talk about their life cycle in the last podcast. The cicadas in southwestern Virginia have emerged. There's a link in the show notes for that. Or uh, if you missed it, you can check out our website. It's uh, peaceful, peacefulheartfarm.com. You can click or tap podcast on the menu and give it a list. It'll be right near, not right near the beginning of the list of, of podcasts. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we have feral cats that roam around our property. And uh, we're okay with that uh, as long as they don't harm any of our animals. Um, There is one in particular that we have seen time and time again over the past couple of months. Uh, she intimidates the quail <laughs> just by being there. She's hanging around. She's always watching, drooling over their uh, plumpness. Anyway, I saw her go under the carport a couple of times. I figure she was stalking mice or some other small varmints under somewhere back there. I found out a few days ago that that was not the case. As I was about to pull the car back into the carport after going to town or running an errand or something, I saw a black lump right in my tire track, where my tire track would go. And it wasn't there before, or at least I hadn't noticed it before. And I stopped and I got out to investigate without pulling on up into the carport. As I approached, the black lump abruptly jumped up and dashed behind the air conditioner compressor. compressor. So I calmly walk over there and peeked behind the unit and sure enough there was a little black kitten there it had small white markings on feet head and tail just little small spots Uh, it's quite cute I looked a little further and I found another black lump of fur hiding back in the corner also marked similarly two kittens so that explains the mama cat hanging out under the carport and us seeing so much of her 
this morning, I moved the goats back in with the rest of the girls. I don't know how they got back over in 10 when everybody else was in 12. But anyway, I moved them with the rest of the girls, the cows, the sheep, and the donkeys. And they moved easily. Most of them have shed their cashmere winter coats and are looking quite sleek. Although one, one of them is looking really ragged. I may have to shear her. She has a very heavy overcoat, which impedes the undercoat of cashmere from shedding completely. It mats, I mean, really mats hard and becomes impossible to comb out. But the clippers work well to get her cleaned up. We had our final lamb born two days ago. I thought we might get another set of twins based on the size of her. But no, another giant girl, nearly 12 pounds. And again, these lambs are generally 6 to 8 pounds at birth. Maybe, well, let me say 7 to 9 pounds. Let's, let's do that. So these 12-pound babies are just unusual. But she's healthy and active. She's a chunk, yeah, so she is healthy and active. Um, and I'm so glad to be done with lambing. And for the first time in a long time, no issues with moms or lambs dying. Uh, no abandoned or neglected lambs that require bottle feeding. Yay. Let's pray for their continued health. We will be bringing them in for a health check in about a week or so. And we'll also check uh, their worm load. They have a parasite that can really take them, especially the lambs, take them down quickly. It's a blood-sucking parasite. Um, and we do have to treat that with a chemical if we spot it. But uh, we checked them a couple months ago and there was no sign of it. So... Uh, Hopefully, they'll be okay. So they might get that once or twice a year would be the most. Actually, they, they haven't had worming twice a year, even once a year in, in several years. We've really improved our herd uh, with, with the way that we maintain our pastures is, is what really helps keep these ewes and their lambs healthy. So we end this lambing season with nine new babies. Well, one is actually nearly four months old and harder to spot as a lamb every day. He's just a few inches shy of being as tall as his mom. These little critters grow so fast. And they'll all be like that in a few months. And they are the cutest animals on the homestead, in my opinion, but only for a short while. Uh, then they look and act like the adults. It's hard to tell them apart. But until that time, finding them jumping and hopping in the evening during playtime is a pleasure I never get tired of experiencing. They, they usually right near dusk at the, when they're running around and they will jump straight up in the air and come with their legs straight out. It just, anyway, it's hard to describe, but they're just the cutest things when you see them jumping like that. Uh, but it only, again, it only lasts two or three months and then... Then they kind of start blending in. They don't jump like that so much anymore. Now, as far as the cows, I need to correct something I said last time regarding the cows and artificial insemination. It's a small thing, but I like to be accurate. I said that the AI was initiated with a uterine implant and a shot. Scott corrected me. It was a vaginal implant. Okay, but on Monday, there was a uterine implant. The artificial insemination with the semen actually took place. Now, we wait for 21 days to see if they come into heat again. If so, we try again. And I'm already counting the days, and I do, the, do it more than one time per day. It's going to be a long three weeks, let me tell you. So that went really well and really uh, pleased with uh, our experience with that and looking forward to having heifer calves because we used sexed semen if it works. Now, if it doesn't work, we may get unsexed semen and try that. So I'll keep you posted on that. Now, as far as the quail, we have 64 eggs in the incubator. I talked about that couple weeks ago and on Friday they go into lockdown and that means the eggs come out of the automatic egg turner and they just lay flat on the bottom of the incubator and then the incubator is 
resealed and cannot be opened until three days after the first quail chick hatches. And I expect to hear the first peeps on Saturday or Sunday at the very latest. And I'll be able to give you a total number of new chicks in the next podcast. But that lockdown period is very important uh, to keep the temperatures the same, to keep the humidity uh, the same. If one of them starts to hatch out and cracks the shell, and, and you know, you've seen eggs that have kind of that inner membrane on them. Uh, so quail eggs are the same. And if you were to open the lid and one of those was cracked, uh, that membrane might just suck right down onto them and literally kind of smother them. Uh, so we're really careful about that. And once we reach that lockdown period, then we wait until three days after the first chick hatched. They have enough nutrition in them to last for three days. And uh, But at that three-day mark, we will open the incubator and take them all and put them in what's called a brooder, which is a small protected environment with a heat lamp on it. So that's how that's going to go. Let me talk about the garden. Scott and I transplanted all of the tomatoes and peppers into the garden. Um, I started them. There, there are like 50 tomato plants, and I'm thinking we have... Uh, three times 24 pepper plants. So that's what? I'm drawing a blank. 24, 48, 60. So that's, no, that's not right. 72? Is that right? 72 pepper plants? And there's cayenne pepper and California Wonders, which are standard green pepper. I've got, um, I've got a mild jalapeno pepper. I've got some serrano peppers. What else? A sweet banana pepper. There's a sweet cherry pepper. So lots and lots of peppers. And I'll be drying those. So we're gonna have we'll have dried peppers so that I can use them for cooking throughout the year. So I'm pretty excited about that. I haven't grown that many peppers in a while. We're really uh, have a small variety of vegetables that we're growing this year. Uh, beans, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, onions, sunflowers. So uh, lots of different kinds of beans and dried peas and dried beans. and So all of that stuff is going on. So anyway, we transplanted all the tomatoes and peppers. And I, I had started them from seeds some time ago. They And they've been ready to transplant for more than a week, maybe even two weeks. But the weather was not quite right. It kept dipping into these cold spells. And... And tomatoes need a good, warm environment. So it finally, the weather warmed up. And so having completed that part of the planting, nearly the entire garden is planted. There are 10 raised beds and two long walls. And so all of that is planted except for four beds. And those four beds, I still have a bunch of celery starts that I need to transplant. And I have lots and lots of culinary herbs. I have cilantro, parsley, basil, oregano, thyme, rosemary, and mint. And all of those still need to be transplanted into the garden. However, today was not the day to do that because the weather, again, the temperature finally reached a nice mid 70s to low 80s range for about three days straight. And it looked like, you know, hey, we're, we're past all of the cold. And I think that's right. But I guess spring's already over. Today it reached 90 degrees. Now I can deal with 90 degrees in the summer, but in the spring I'll just stay inside and imagine that it is still balmy outside. I don't want to lose that feeling of spring until much later. There's plenty of time for steamy hot days in July and August. And I love to see the garden full of green. The potatoes are up, the beans, the peas, all of that has come up. The sunflowers are planted all along the entire west end. It's about 70 feet. And I didn't count the number of plants, but I'm guessing about 50. Also, we have about 50 tomato plants on the other long wall, as I talked about. So the sunflowers are mammoth sunflowers. So they will get really big heads and have lots of seeds. And I've watched a couple of videos on what do you do with that? How, how do you actually dry them and, and store them? So 
uh, I watched a couple of videos, so I'm educated for the fall harvest of those giant flowers filled with seeds. I love having these new experiences. Literally, I am growing these for fun. I'll probably feed them to the birds this winter. I just want to see, I just want to grow a sunflower. Now, the most exciting news that I have today is the creamery. The small cheese cave is complete. And we moved all of our current cheeses in there for aging. And today, Scott ordered a humidifier that will assist with keeping the moisture at the proper level. I've never had this before because we used uh, a special control to control that we could control the temperature, but we couldn't control the humidity in the area that we were aging our tree cheeses in before and controlling humidity is really important because that cheese will just dry out and crack. I, I either had to uh, wax cheeses to keep, keep them from drying out or I would make small batches and keep them in plastic containers with lids to keep the humidity up for certain cheeses. So this new setup offers a multitude of possibilities. And Earlier this year, I began working on what is called a washed rind cheese. In a nutshell, that means that when the cheese comes out of the press, another process is started to create the perfect rind on the cheese. Instead of doing wax, I'm trying to do this natural rind. And these, this is one of the cheeses that I use the plastic containers with the lid. Uh, it always... Uh, a washed rind is going to involve some kind of a brining or saltwater bath that you're you're wiping the outside or sometimes even dipping the cheese into a saltwater bath. And it can be just salted water or it might be salted water with additional cultures that are designed to grow specific molds on the surface of the cheese. And that creates a unique rind and it adds flavor to the cheese as well. I am so excited at the possibilities that I can do when I have control of, or I can keep the, uh, not so much control of the humidity, but I can keep it up higher. The 30, 40, 50% just is not good for a cheese cave. You really want it 85 or 90, but anywhere, if it's 70 plus, I'll be happy. And Along those same lines, recently I acquired some new cheese molds. One is designed to create a cheese called Revlicon. And some of you may know of this cheese, but for those that don't know about it, here is a short description. It's a French cheese that originated in the Savoy Mountains, and it's a washed rind cheese, as I just described. The center is very soft. Similar to a camembert, if you've, if you've ever had a camembert or a brie. And officially, it's made with raw milk, which we do a lot of, right? However, the cheese making and aging is essentially complete, just shy of the 60 days required for commercial raw milk in the U.S. So the only way to have this cheese in the U.S. is to make it yourself. All cheese, raw milk cheese, has to be aged 60 days, and this one is going to be done just prior to that 60 days. Now, there is a pasteurized version, but it just isn't the same. I'll only be making very small batches for the two of us, and for any herd share owner that expresses an interest. They also own the animal. If you own the animal, you can have anything you want. I expect to perfect my washed rind cheese skills. So I'm just learning how to do this and I'm going to practice on the Reblicon. Now also those perfected skills will assist me in creating a washed rind version of our pinnacle cheese. So I'll be working with this one as well. It's an alpine style cheese. You'll find it to be similar to a traditional Swiss Gruyere cheese. And with the completion of the cheese cave, these kinds of new opportunities are just waiting to be explored so many different cheeses that I can make. I will stick with our basic cheeses. Uh, mostly I'm going to make those because uh, I need to be focused on, on those, but I am going to experiment in small amounts for ju just to try different cheeses. Nothing that I'm going to make on a commercial basis, but just when you, when you have that homestead, you can, you can try new and interesting things. And I don't have to try to find these 
raw milk cheeses in the in the grocery store because you're not you're not going to find a raw milk camembert or brie uh, or it's all always going to be made with pasteurized milk and it just alters the flavor very strongly so as long as you keep your acid uh, content correct and you have clean uh, procedures which we do we have it all written down exactly um, how you get from here to there and how you keep everything clean because you you have to because it's all about the molds and yeast and whatnot so cleanliness is extremely important in cheese making okay final thoughts uh there is never a dull moment here something new is happening each and every day or so it seems at least in the spring that's true most days there's more to do than it is possible to accomplish and spring bursts up out of the ground at a dead run and sometimes it's hard to keep up and these warm days invoke a new creativity in me new growth in me just as the new growth is literally springing out of the ground and i'm so excited about making cheese right now with a new cheese cave and new opportunities to be a better cheese maker with a larger skill set i am in seventh heaven if you enjoyed this podcast please hop over to apple podcasts subscribe and give me a five star rating and a review it only takes a few minutes and it helps so much to make this available to others who might be interested in learning about the homestead life please share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content that is absolutely the best way to help our podcast out here thank you so much for stopping by the homestead and until next time may god fill your life with grace and peace <music>